Alright, so this is the ring light. Okay. This is the LED pointing at me. Hmm. Switch it back one more time, let me check. Huh. Let's go with both. That's better. Okay. That way to light up my face and then okay. light up my face. <laughs> and by the way, really, I knew how the I knew how it was looking. I just wanted you to keep switching the lights off and on. You know why? Because uh, you wanted to see me move. I want now. I want to see the booty as you moved. I saw the booty. There we go. <laughs> there we are. There we are. There. I got a, a really nice looking bum for a forty year old woman. Dave Darren is paying a visit to from Philadelphia. Hello? Hello? Water. Take Broad Street North, right on Fashion Oak Avenue. Oh, you're from Philadelphia? Kind of like the mummers and cheesesteaks and pretzels. He's the best there is. That is so gay. Yeah. Hero. He's got his head up his butt, but he's really yeah. interesting. But Listen, Dick, how would you like me to make your life a living hell? Do not go in there. Fourth See? One that would have been here. Interesting. <laughs> this is why you're my favorite DJ on wow. this. There's no place he won't go. Oh, nothing he won't won't do. Are you threatening me? Oh! And no one. Major wow factor. He can't handle it. Dave Darren. Yes! 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 Pam Taylor on the Dave Darren Show. How's it going, Pam? Wonderful. How's it going, Dave? Good. Pretty good. It's great to see you. This is our makeup interview. We, were, we did an interview before, and we screwed it up. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I screwed it up. I really did. I, I clogged up all of my bandwidth. I would, but there's an excuse. My wife and I were loading up some of our amateur porn, so it's taking up all of our bandwidth. <laughs> so now, now, and I, I don't know why we call it amateur because we're so good at it. We're like great at it. It's not amateur porn anymore. It's professionally done with two tremendous performers. So that's, that's what, the only kind of porn I like to watch, Derek. <laughs> is that yeah? The amateur stuff is good. <laughs> so the amateur stuff is. Would you say? Yeah, I would say that absolutely, absolutely. That's a cool phone you got there, and you got a great background. So, but let's talk about the music, not the artwork in the background. Did you just come off a tour? You were doing like a, a world tour, weren't you? Like cross country, cross I the globe. I did halfway around the world. I went to. I started off in Scotland, uh -huh. and then I went down to England, and then I went over to the Netherlands, and then I ended up in Switzerland, and then I had a little uh, rendezvous in Milan. I didn't have a performance there, but I just stayed there a few days, and then I went on to Israel, where I had my secret release party. Wow! So and then came. Israel was your finest gig. Now, you know, funny, something funny about Israel. I actually, last weekend, I met a girl from Israel. Now, it's funny because when I lived in Japan, there's a lot of people from Israel that live in Japan. They're selling, they're selling like stuff in the street. They're there actually illegally. I don't know if you know that. We, don't, we have illegal aliens all over the world, not only just in the United States. I was living in Japan. There were the Israels, and they sell like little brooches, and they call them pika pika brooches. Pika pika means they're very shiny. Do you like my pickas? Oh, yeah. No. Do you like my pickas? No. Hey, 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 hey. They say they call them pika pika brooches. In Japanese is funny because if you have a car and it's got some problems to it and it makes a noise like chuk 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 chuk, they call that boto boto. And if you have an empty head, they call it kuru kuru pa. So it's like all the, all the sounds you could possibly make are in the Japanese language. So it's kind of funny. It really is interesting. Well, I didn't expect you to give a Japanese lesson today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. But I started off the you never know. Yep, I started off the Japanese lesson because I told her I met this girl from Israel. It was funny because I went to this bar in New York City, and when I was in New York City, my wife and I we experiment. We're swingers a little bit, so I'm at this bar. Well, and, what does it mean? You only swing one way and not the other. <laughs> hey, baby, want to take a gander at some penis? Or to the right side because I'm left-handed. So you're right. Don't confuse me. You're pulling me off topic. I'm here for you, Dave. <laughs> so like I said, I met this girl from Israel. And uh, it was it was kind of funny because she I was really doing well with her. And my wife said, man, she's going to be cute. Why don't, we, why don't we try to talk to her? And so I'm over there talking to her. And the girl from that I thought was, uh, she, I, I was touching her and I could feel 
like a microphone down the pants. So I knew I knew it was a dude, right? So I got a little bit scared, and my wife got scared. But I decided to go back there the next week, right? So I went back the next week, and we found another girl that was very attractive, very attractive. I went up to her, and another girl was, like, feeling me up. Despite the way I look, she was feeling me up. And I put my hand down her pants, and she says, Baby, Israel vagina. So that's how I know she was from Israel. Israel vagina. <laughs> you can't hey, make that shit up, Dave. <laughs> Actually, I did. Don't steal my jokes. I had a, I had a weird moment in Israel. In that, Israel, like, oh my God. Oh, tell us about it. I'm curious. All the audience is curious. Tell us about your unusual events going on. <laughs> All right, so in Israel, everything happens really late. So we're having dinner at this restaurant, sitting around the bar. It's probably like 11 o'clock Israel time. And um, I'm there, we're sitting around with my friends, and I meet this guy on the side over on this side. So I'm leaning over, kind of talking to him a lot because he's just really trying to talk to me about really cool things to do in Israel and things not to do. And I'm just talking to him a little bit because they're around the corner a little bit, and I, it was hard for me to talk to them. And then... So we go through our dinner, and I'm like, I, I got to use the bathroom. So I get up, and I walk out, and I look down, and my, my phone it had a text message from one of my friends around the corner, and it said, are you trying to get some D from this guy? Wow. And I'm like, and I, it, and I didn't even see it until later, so I'm going down to the bathroom. The bathroom is, like, downstairs, and then it's off into a back room around a corner. So I'm walking around the back corner, and I almost run into this guy. I mean, I mean, we kind of do run into each other. And I say, oh, excuse me. And he just grabs me and started kissing me. Oh. We're making out in the bathroom down below the restaurant. And my friends are thinking about, wondering if I'm trying to get D from this guy at the bar. And I'm down there making out with the guy in the bathroom. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I've been, it had it, it, been, so Israel was towards the end of my trip. And it was one of those times where I, I was open to having a Euro dance. I'm newly single. I'm, you know, I'm feeling good. I'm looking good. I, I was open to it and not a thing. No, no love connections, no sparks the whole time. And then I get just boom in the bathroom. What, what do we call that? I, I turn into a hot mess in the men's bathroom in Israel. And it only lasted for like five minutes. And then his girlfriend was knocking at the door. His girlfriend. I mean, I don't know. They were speaking Hebrew. I don't know what they were saying. But he ended up telling me later, like whenever I, I run out to the bathroom, and I was like, oh, my God, that's the men's bathroom. And I ran into the women's bathroom, and then she come in there and was, like, washing her hands, checking me out. I didn't know what in the world was going to happen. So I just, I just walked out and started washing my hands, and she left. And then when I went back up to meet my friends, he called me out there, and they were standing there. She was like this with her arms like this, and he was like, come here, come here. And I was like, oh, shit, what have I gotten myself into? Yeah. And I walked up, and he was like, we're just on a date. And I, they're talking Hebrew, and she's, she, she's got this, her arms like this. She's just not taking it. And I look at her, and I'm like, look, I don't understand Hebrew, so I don't know what in the world he's telling you. But I got to go. It was nice meeting y'all. Bye. Come on. Like that. And took off from it. But that was my crazy Euromance in Israel. You can't make that shit up. Like, wow. That is. So I, I like when things like that happen, because if we'd have pursued it, he's probably, the idea of him is always better than him, because any guy that's in a restaurant on a date with his girlfriend, whether or not it's the first date or not, he grabs a girl and starts making out with her in the bathroom. It's not a guy I want to date anyway. Yeah, so. no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> the, the only good part. It was a fun story. You can't make that shit up. <laughs> the only fun part of that story for me is you said it was only five minutes. So I feel good about that because I only last about three or four minutes. So I'm all, I am only one minute shorter than a Hebrew guy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why I, I'm, I'm only one minute shorter. If I was not circumcised like the Hebrew guy, I could have lasted that one extra minute. Right? Oh, is that what that, that, it's that, you're going to blame it on that? I'm blaming it on the circumcision. Is that like a universal problem? Yeah, that is, I heard that, you know, I heard that American men are one of the few countries where we circumcise that shit. That's what I heard. I don't know. I guess you could tell us about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> How many of y'all are circumcised? <laughs> this is a question for the agency. We got to know. Yep. And does it have anything to do? Well, I guess you wouldn't know if you are or aren't. You wouldn't have the experience of being are or not if you aren't already. I'm upset with my parents because <laughs> I, I blame them. Not for the mutilation. I blame them for the smaller penis. And, and supposedly it cuts down the sensitivity on the male when they're circumcised. I've heard that. Yep. 
Yep. Damn. All that I'm missing. I'm missing it. Uh, well, they, you know, too much of a good thing is, is that where that comes from? We're not going to have, we like to have fun, but not too much fun, so here. One hand and chop, 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 chop. You hate my nuts. The skin's at the bottom. The skin comes right off. The skin comes right off. Four or five seconds, it's done. Was there a best country to do your tour? I don't know that there was a best, but there it's just different. But over in Europe, I guess, being an American, being a woman, playing guitar, and sounding like I do, I'm like a unicorn over there. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it's, it, over here, it's not as special. Just like somebody coming from Europe, coming over here to tour, they're the unicorn over here. I think that has a lot to do with it. And it's, uh, I mean, obviously, they connected with me on a musical sense. Just add in all that other stuff, and it just makes it then more amazing. But it's like, I went to, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival was pretty phenomenal. The, the fact that it's been going on 70 years and that how it came to be. So what they did was they set up camp on the fringes of that festival and did their show anyway. And that's how the name becomes the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. But the idea behind that Fringe Festival was just really awesome. That everyone is included and nobody can be turned down to play. Um, and the ha So just being a part of that and its 70th, 70th anniversary, that made that really special to me in Scotland in general. But the place that I connected most to... Oh, not even a musical sense, but just my heart. I mean, maybe it was because of the view, but it was Switzerland. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. It's one of my. It was the most beautiful place. We stayed at a place. Uh, I played at a place called Hotel La Campagnola, and it's like a. It reminded me a lot of Lake Tahoe. If anybody's been to Lake Tahoe, I think having all that time to spend there with the family, the the hotel owner. Stefano loves music and his family loves music and they were all playing instruments and sitting in with me and it, it was just it was just pretty it was pretty cool it was a last minute gig that got added there were so many magical moments it's really hard to say but just the, the landscape of, of Switzerland was beautiful Scotland's beautiful the Netherlands is you know I was there just a short period of time and uh, probably not enough time to connect so I'm working on another tour in the Netherlands right now as we speak I'm gonna try to spend at least 10 days Mm -hmm. There, so give me a good idea of, of what I wanted to do when I go back. Cool. What yeah. I didn't have time to do. And obviously, Israel was unreal. Getting yeah. to spend Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, the oh. New Year, and and to go to a, a wedding there to participate in, and have my senior release party there. It was just wow, tremendous, tremendous. Sometimes you got to climb all the way to the top of the mountain so you can see it. It's hard to get up there, man. Sometimes it can be. But that's what this song is about. It's called Mountain. Every day gaining wisdom as I grow In a blink of an eye Progress seems slow But in the whole scheme of it all it's just a moment in time And it passes by But I, I'm getting perspective Using directives From the eye in the sky I am a mountain Yeah I had no collision of one was that fall, but the sky opened up and the rain did fall. A tiny grain of sand I can't understand now how it created it all. Wonders of this world, like the love between a boy and girl. Under the sea, I will not crumble, I will not fall, no, cause I'm a mountain.
ocean sea Behold the mystery Leaving footprints in the sands of time Look up and you will find I'm a mountain I am a mountain Yeah Well I'm a mountain Yeah yeah Oh I'm a mountain Yeah 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 Can y'all feel it? Can y'all feel it? Each and every one of you beautiful people. Well, I am a mountain. Yeah. A lot of the bands that I talk about in the United States, you know, the most that they'll tour is within the country, within the U.S. And when I ask them, I say, how is it from city to city? And how are they making ends meet? Or is it a profitable thing to do going from New York City to Washington to Boston to Baltimore? When I'm in Phoenix, going to L.A. or going to, to different parts. For an international tour, is it something that is, is significantly profitable? Is it something that you take a risk doing? Tell us about, I'm curious about the finances of, of a world tour. Well, you know, I... It wasn't a traditional tour for me. The next time I do it, I will do it differently, but I needed to get away. It, 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 was, it started as a pilgrimage that right. turned into me being able to perform over there. So, yeah, when I go back now that I've made the connections and network, and it's going to be more profitable, but I dug into my savings to go as if I were going to go on a, on a pilgrimage and just go for me. And, and I made sure I had time to connect with people and, and sightsee and do the touristy thing. And uh, I wasn't just a boom, 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 play shows and move on and not really get to have that, you know, like I'm on vacation kind of feeling. I, I had a lot of those moments. There were a lot of those moments where I felt like I was on a, a rigid tour, but then, you know, there was, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I made enough money to get me to the next place and to the next place and to the next place. Uh -huh. and, and eventually, ultimately, uh, I spent everything I made to get home. Were you able to write any music there? Or because I'm curious about this. It, when you're there in the moment and you're capturing the emotions of the moment, it's something almost I feel like you can't store it away and do it later. You've got to do it right as it's happening to catch that immediate rush of emotion. Did you write it, anything out there? Were you writing any music? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've written several. And, uh, and you're right. It's hard in that moment. I get an idea, and that's what I love about my smartphone, like my iPhone. I can just go in the notes. I can record. In Scotland, I wrote a song called Lover's Lane. It's about a story uh, I made up in my mind about uh, seeing an old couple walking down this so-called Lover's Lane. And, and it's a real place. they got a recording studio called Lover's Lane. I didn't even know until I had written the song and came up with the idea to do like an acoustic version of it and then have all of my Scotland people that I made music with while I was there go in and record and make it like a big deal song. Uh -huh. So I wrote that song with a, a host family I was living with, uh, Patricia and Jonathan. And I, I, I was sat around, I had the idea, and I went and I sat with them around the table, and I was like, I need some, you know, I need to throw some ideas. I really, I really feel like this needs to, to come out right now. And so I wrote it with them sitting right there around the table that night. And then I, I learned about the hurricane. The hurricanes happened while I was at Hurricane Harvey. Harvey. I was in England when that happened. And I was dancing around with my host family, and I, and I wanted to show her something on Facebook. And I flipped to my Facebook, and I saw a feed of one of my really close friends 
uh, and the music, another soul sister of Musically, she she had lost everything. Oh, but she had been on tour, so look, she had like two suitcases with her. But she was being rolled away from her home, and tears were flowing down her cheeks, and she was singing this little light of mine. And right then and there, I, I, I started crying, and my host family, she's from Turkey and didn't speak hardly any English. She's like wondering why I just started crying all of a sudden. And I, I tried to explain to her as best I could, and she got all emotional, and I was like, excuse me, I got to go write this song. And then I went to my room, and I wrote this song called Full Moon Over Texas about the hurricane. It was almost a full moon in England. And it just spoke to me, so I went right straight to my room and wrote this song. And it's still a full moon. I was thinking maybe by now everything would be all right. So y'all bear with me. It's so brand new, but I'd love to share it. Because I don't I think I'm supposed to because I'm still under the full moon, so this is when I should share it, right? Yeah, I agree. This goes out to all my friends and family and friends and loved ones. Anybody else is in Texas or fleeing or trying to get away from Texas tonight. to America where he went to a three-day uh, three Grateful Dead concert in Las Vegas. 
and about a uh, pink show dancer he met called Sugar Rose. And so I wrote a song about that called Sugar Rose. And I didn't write it until I got to Milan and I wrote it with a girl that I was staying with, Veronica Sherba. Fairbilla. Fergia. I can't I, I love these people's names and I screw them up totally when I try to say them. So they're beautiful anyway. So I ended up writing with her to finish that song. So yeah, there's three that came out of it. I got one that I'm writing about Jerusalem. Uh, I had another one that came out of the healing from it. It's called How Long Is Long Enough. I've been all around the world and back, and, and I still feel a little brokenhearted. So how long is long enough? You know, so that came out of that trip. I was inspired by it. So there's a lot of, of yeah. inspiration from my tour. And, and uh, yeah, so, yeah, to answer your question. Cool. Okay. I'll tell you <laughs> what. Let, let's play a piece of music now. I've got a few to play tonight from you. What should we start off with? Witch's Ball. I made the music video myself. Okay. Oh, cool. I started doing that. So uh, I, I wanted to capture the feeling that I, that I, I, you know, it's just like a fear. All your fears come true and giving in to fear. So it's like everybody's worst nightmares in this video. Okay, cool. Let's play this. Here we go on the Dave Barrett Show. Let me minimize this. Drag some stuff over. Enlarge the window. It's smooth today. Man, today everything is going so smoothly. It's incredible. Here we go on the Dave Barrett Show. <laughs> Confess, I will lose your soul to the witch's bone. 
a tremendous video, tremendous song all together. I love that you got a black cat there too. I love that as well. <laughs> Kitty. So what's the cat's what's the cat's name? Kitty. Kitty. It's a funny story. <laughs> a really funny story. That's like me when I when right. I when I lived in Japan, our dog's name was Inu, which stands for dog in Japanese. <laughs> well, I rescued her and the lady that I rescued her from said that she was a boy. So I wanted to pick out a name that characterized her character. His right. character. So I had spent all that time thinking of a boy name. And then I took her to the vet, him to the vet, come to find out it's a girl. So then I had to spend all this extra time going over girl names. And by that time, I'd been calling it Kitty that whole time. So I didn't want to confuse her. <laughs> so Kitty it was. Oh, there you go. That's cool. <laughs> so now, by the way, I have a constant war with Facebook. Have you had wars with Facebook? I'm curious about this. Have you? You know, where they put me in jail or decide that I don't know who might want to come to my show or not because there's too many invites. Or yes, I share yes. That sort of thing. Constantly? Do you have it constantly? Well, I I don't have it constantly. I quit trying to invite so many people to my events. I just post an event and then boost it, and it kind of just keeps it going, and, and that keeps me from having to do that. Uh -huh. And um, I post in groups a lot. Okay. Not too oh. many, though, or they'll get you for that. And yeah. They, they, they I have a just could you imagine running Facebook? Oh, I, I can't. Well, could you I, imagine answering people's questions? Well, it must be real easy to manage Facebook because no one ever gets back to me. So they're, for all I know, it's a computer no, it's sitting there like in the room. Well, they just stick you in jail. They don't like you, they'll just put you in jail. You're going to start a riot. And we're going to walk out the front door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in jail right now. I can't post in the groups. So I'm in jail. Yeah. And actually, it's funny. I like, said it looks like our government. If it's too much, they just put you in jail. He's a spy. Blow him up. I'm going to go take a shit. I I'm curious about this. Traveling all these different countries throughout the, throughout the world and having the excitement of being up on stage. And we already talked about, you know, different venues and stuff like that. When you're up on stage and you're singing to a crowd that doesn't necessarily understand English, are, are you like a celebrity for being the person who's up there on stage singing in the cool language of English? I love it whenever people from, from the UK come here to the United States because when we hear you speak, the accent is so proper. You could be talking about trash, it sounds amazing. Who could leave all this rubbish here? This is such a travesty. This is all this, this destruction here all over the sidewalk. Well, okay, someone must tend to this at once. This is ridiculous. People are listening in. I don't know what happened over there, but the shit hit the fan. That guy from England is pissed. I don't know. What the hell is rubbish? Is that part of the intrigue? Well, really, to be honest, over there, most people grew up watching American television. So they have a real, they understand English better than they can speak it. Yeah. I got that a lot. They understand me. Uh, they, they, they listen to American music. They listen, watch American television. So they're just really, I didn't have that issue. Only one, I think I was in, when I was in Switzerland, but uh, the owner, the hotel owner would translate things that I needed him to say. And everybody understands this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, that's my message is love and self-love. And, you know, I mean, that, that's universal. And, and that's what the music does to us. I, I, I infect my music with love and positive intentions and you know i might like like we said last time i might say fuck and love god in the same sentence and i mean like it's sweet and spicy that's what yin and yang black and white good and bad light and dark that's all it's a balance of all of it and i think that's what you know my message is 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 to accept all of those parts of ourselves uh-huh i'm curious and about this um, i'm also curious about this when i'm in new york city new york city has an interesting way of making sure the bands have some financial reward for playing. Now, what they do is I have no idea what the financial situation of the venue is, but I do know that they pass around a tip jar. And the way that they do it is they have one of the waitresses or, or bartenders that's on break now carry the tip jar around to the couples because the guy would look like a real douchebag if he wasn't putting some money in there when he's with that girl that he's hoping he's going to fill up in the men's room or the women's room, right? So they're walking around with that guilty perspective that fill up the tip jar. Now, when you're traveling the globe and people are giving you money, they're giving you yen, they're giving you rubles, they're giving you... How do you know what the... You might have gotten like a huge tip from this millionaire 
or you might have gotten like a couple pennies from this douchebag. How do you know what you're getting? I studied a little bit before. I mean, there's there's the Scotland has its own bank uh, uh, pounds, the Scottish pounds, and then there's the British pounds, and then there's euros, and then there was Switzerland has their own currency, Swiss francs, and then Israel has their own currency. That, I think that was the most confusing. Everything's kind of close, so it's not except for Israel. It takes thirty three point five shekels to make one U.S. dollar. So 30 shekels is like 10 bucks. Oh, so you are into bondage. Oh, you didn't say shackles. You said shekels. I'm sorry. I, excuse me. Excuse me. No, it's really shekels, not shekels. <laughs> yeah, but hey, well, you know, it's each his own. I just watched a weird movie about that called Barrel's Game. That was freaky. Huh. you seen that? No, but as soon as I'm done with the interview here, I'm going to be spending some masturbation time with the cleaning box here watching it. You should it's it's messed up. It's a mind fuck. It's, it really is. But they start out having fun with the thing, and then he ends up, I ain't going to tell you, I'll give it away, but it ends up not being a really good situation you want to be handcuffed to the bed in. Oh, ooh, wow. Ooh, Gerald's game. It's just, it's crazy. Crazy cool if you like that kind of psychological yeah. I'm gonna have to Right, which is bomb. I'm going to have to make sure my wife doesn't see that because my wife is very interested in one perspective of my life, which is an attempted homicide. So I'm going to have to make sure she doesn't watch that. <laughs> okay, cool. So she doesn't watch that. So the new track you got out there, which we are going to play probably at the tail end of the show, although that was your newest one. Which is Ball was the newest one, That right? was the newest one. That, that was, was the newest one. We didn't do it any, in order. We, that was the newest one. Then we'll go back to, we'll do them backwards. So okay. the next one we'll do House of Cards. Okay, but explain to me which is Ball. Obviously, that was a video that you did on your own. You actually captured all the images, mixed up the images and all that stuff. Is it a challenge? Would you rather not do... Would you rather be just a musician and not be involved in the video aspects and the marketing aspects? Is that a diversion from your career where you just wish you could just be the writer promote uh, doing the songs on stage and not have to do all that other stuff? Because that... It takes time. It takes stuff away from your talents. That is part of my talents now, dear. Oh, okay. It's like one of those things that another way for me to be creative. I make jewelry, too. So I only make videos. It says that I don't feel like this takes out of my time, you know, just because, you know, it's something that's not exactly music. I, I love doing all of it. I think the, the new, I want to help people, to be honest. Uh -huh. I want to eventually be able to help people who can't make videos. I learned how to do it so I could do it for myself because it one it costs money. Yeah, sure. And uh, that that's one thing since losing my regular job, a nine to five job where I get a regular paycheck. That's something that's you know it's not coming in as quickly as it used to. So to be able to save money because I can make my own video, that's huge. And then learning that I can make it and it's good and people like it. It's, it's, it's already got over 5,000 views, and it's only been out a couple days. Nice. So that lets me know. I mean, that's just, like I said, it's just another way to be creative for me. So I really, I like doing it. I make promo posters. I can, I'm going to start making promo videos. I've made that little teaser. I, I do. I enjoy it. Yeah. And I, it gives me something to do. Because it, look, performing music is not a full-time job for me. It's, I, think I, I think I have my hand in a lot of different things yeah and that makes me happy i get bored mm -hmm. so i have to have like a plethora of things to keep my mind from going oh the squirrel do you know what i mean and then it, keep, yeah. it keeps me focused to have so many different things because i'll just get bored with one thing i gotta move on and then i've made probably now probably four thousand pieces individual pieces of jewelry in just a little like a year and a half yeah, <laughs> okay but... now that every, for every piece of jewelry that was a, a thought i was trying to calm yeah, what would you do in this case? Okay, so you become a, a mainstream, significant, big-time artist. You're touring, you're, you're on stage 300 days a week. And, and everyone is, they, they know the songs that they love from your best hits CD. So you've got to play, you've got to play these seven songs because the fans want to come to see your concert and they want to hear these seven songs. And you already said sometimes you have an issue with boredom and you need something different. What are you going to do when the demand is out there to play these seven songs every night that you play for 300 nights a week? 
Are you going to be creative with the way they sound? Are you going to do... Well, how are you going to make that fresh every appearance? Mm. You well, you know, I... Or does the audience I make it I'll so fresh? When I get there. Mm. Okay. It's a good, it's I, I do write so often, it's hard. Because I got a lot of people that request stuff from Hot Mess record, my first record, that I don't do. And I will try to do, the, do it for them. But it's different. I get my solo shows versus, like doing a band show because what, what I have to do now is like I don't spend all this time rehearsing with the band I hire really great players and they learn the set I tell them so if I'm at a show and somebody goes oh well you do this I thought we're not going to because we didn't rehearse it it wasn't on the set if it wasn't on the set because that's just how it is but I try to accommodate like when I'm doing a solo show I will try my best to play whatever I can but just in those situations but I don't really want to tour 300 days a year to be honest I like being home. I like cre- I like creating. I like being in the studio. I like making jewelry. I love doing the behind the scenes work with the video. I love all aspects of it. I love my newest endeavor is uh, events and benefits company where I plan and host and I even perform at benefits or events where there's bringing awareness to something, either a business or a cause or a charity or something. Because I put on so many benefits since I started playing it. It's like the first benefit I played at and I was a part of it gave me those feels that I just, you know, you can't get anywhere else. No, There's not drugs good enough to make you feel like handing a, a check of $5,000 to a family in need at Christmas time does for you. There's nothing out there that gives, or at least for me. And so I knew that was something that I wanted to do. So I just started Pound Taylor Presents where I'll be putting on main big events I love festivals and I love helping people I, so I want to put that benefit concert festival feel together with any organization or charity event or individual or family or whatever I can find and I really enjoy doing that it gives me more satisfaction than standing in the corner at a restaurant sports bar or whatnot you know uh-huh. I could totally it's like more bang for my book my main objective is to heal and help others to heal so it might not be two and 300 days a year that's going to help me do that, but it's going to be benefiting others. It's going to be putting on events and those types of things that is going to do that. And, you know, my, my future career, my plans aren't that of the normal everyday artist that's trying to get famous and tour around the world. I just don't really have those same goals. Huh. How about that? That's interesting because I, I periodically, especially recently, I've been trying to talk to bands about goals and work ethic. Now, obviously, you've got a tremendous work ethic because obviously you're so diverse in your career and you're handling all aspects of it. So you're very diverse. You have a great work ethic, plus you toured around the world. So tremendous work ethic. What what should be a today's young artist? What should their goal be? Can you have any advice for some of the young artists coming up? What What should their goal be? Should their goal be to practice to be diverse in what they do that the music is a career but practice and learn the business aspects of it the production of it what, what can you give to the young artists that might help them to move from where they are now to the next level that next little step well there's so much out there to learn from there are so many diy things you can do where you can take cost off and then you learn on but i but, Doing it all myself over the past decade has given me things that are priceless. Yeah. So if you know what's going on, if you if you know the business aspect, it's, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get screwed by some big record label. If you read the contract, if you if your goals are to get signed, if your goals are to get a publishing deal, if you're, whatever your goals are, I think it should be more about what makes you happy. Focus on that. And then like what I've, that's what I've done, and it's like the people who are following me, watching me, are uh, listening to my music, they realize, hey, she's, she's doing something that's making her happy. And that's what I think friends enjoy watching people do. So it depends on what everybody's individual goal is. So you, obviously you got to have good quality music, be unique. But there's so many ways to do music from home now. It's like I'm, I just went and did a big production on Steal Your Heart. My next project is going to be high, low budget. I'm going to see what I can do. I'm going to learn. i got a friend of mine that's teaching me how to record in a home studio. So I'm going to do like my whole next record is going to be as much of me as possible. And then uh, 
and it just keeps shooting songs out. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're a goal as a songwriter to get published, you got to get keep spitting songs out, keep spitting songs out, get a build a catalog, uh, send them, submit them to publishing companies. It just depends. There's so many different avenues. You could do it all. Like do it all. If you want to get a TV and movie placement, there's things for that. There's um, YouTube. I mean, there's so many people that become one-hit wonders overnight because they got some kind of viral video. Who knows what the perfect recipe is for success? The main goal at the end of the day for me is am I happy with my success? Am I happy with what I'm doing? Am I happy with my product? Am I happy with my image? Am I happy with this? Am I moving toward my goals? And then, you know what? I think what happens is we get a timeline and we say we want to have all this done and we want to do it by now or we're going to quit. And I just, I never, I don't feel like there's a certain age. I'm almost 40. So it, it, some people would say well, I'm, I'm past my time for whatever, whatever somebody's definition of success or stardom is. I'm too old for that. I'm too old to go tour at rock star style. You know, it, it, everybody's got an opinion on what success looks like to them. And it, like, that's, that's why it's important at the end of the day is to be happy. Do what makes you happy and don't quit till the miracle happens because it's never over and it's never done and it's never wrong. Give yourself a break and enjoy life. Enjoy what you do and enjoy the people that you come in contact with. Enjoy every networking opportunity. Enjoy every learning experience. If it gets too overwhelming, take a minute. It's not the end of the world. If it, if it all ain't working at the same time, my philosophy is to throw a bunch of mud up against the wall and see what sticks. But you got to be throwing mud. Right, you right. gotta be throwing wood. Right, or nothing's gonna stick. Yeah, and don't throw shit at the wall. Just some advice. Like <laughs> it's the same color. Don't throw shit. Throw mud at the wall. The monkeys do that. <laughs> Clubbing's what my dad taught me. Yes, and he also taught you to throw poo when you're cranky, cause he's a monkey. Take that back. Take what back? You take that back. I can't take back the fact that your dad is an actual monkey. I don't understand. So, okay, so let's play another song. What do we got next? Uh, we're going in reverse order. Is House of Cards the next yeah, one? House of Cards. Okay. House of Cards, I, it's not about that show, but I wrote it the first season that it came out. I wanted, when I was sitting here watching that uh, Netflix, the, the Netflix season, the first season, I had a notepad and a pen, and I was like, I really want to write a song where it's based around an idea in a House of Cards or this song idea came from that i wanted to do it all poker gameplay chips i wanted to incorporate all the lingo from playing cards into it and also the idea so you know uh, house of cards is pretty flimsy yeah yeah you know, that's, that's the idea behind it is living a life that's flimsy like that uh lies um addiction mainly is the the things that come out i'm recovering addict so i know all too well about what it what kind of flimsy house of cards you build living on lies every day trying to cheat and steal and get high and do whatever you know i've already been there done that but that's what this song is about well okay house of cards on the dave darren show this is pam taylor and here we go drag the stuff over and i'm going to press this button right now here we go
tremendous video, tremendous vocals on that, by the way. How did you work up a vocal career, vocal capacity? Was it natural? Did you practice it? How did you crank up those vocal octaves and the notes you hit? Well, it was definitely practice. I was just talking to somebody about this because people say to me, I was like, God, I wish I could sing. And I was like, well, when was the last time you tried to sing? Oh, I just can't. I was like, well, how do you know? What, and what, what have you done to try to become a singer? So I don't feel like I was born with a voice like that. I believe that I was born with enough of a voice and enough of a drive to want to make it better. So I started listening to uh, Coco Taylor, Etta James, Susan Tedeschi. They had that growl. They had that, they had that energy in it. They had that Janis Joplin. Those were the artists that I studied. And at first, my voice could not do the things that it can do now. Hmm. It could. I had to teach it how to have the growl. I had to smoke a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I had to, you know. And, and there's a lot of exercises that. As I lost my voice a few years ago, and I, uh, from misuse because I didn't have any kind of formal training. And on my first record, it was a lot of I mean blues belting. And after. A, a loud band put on top of having to fight with you know g- guitars and the crowds and poor sound and I just wore my voice out so I had to go on complete vocal rest and I had to relearn how to talk I had to read and, and learn how to sing I had to take vocal lessons and I learned a lot just by the little exercises it's remarkable because your body is your instrument for your voice so it's all about the way you hold it how much stress you're under, how much water you drink, the food you eat. It, instead of like a guitar, it's about if the neck is straight, what kind of strings you have, what kind of amp you play. And if you're, if you're vocalist, your body is what you tune. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a lot of practice and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and, and also recording helps, too. My voice, like, live, you, you have to control it a whole lot differently than you do when you record. That mic is so sensitive. It's like it's like a whole different. It's a different kind of performance when you record. Yeah, you know. So I, I learned a lot about my voice and what I could do with it in that situation. Yeah, I think I heard. I think it was Rod Stewart that has a downtime before he does like a, a a big gig. He takes some downtime where he doesn't even talk to his kids and his wife or girlfriend or who I forget the article. But I remember. I think it was him that took significant downtime before that major event where he didn't use the voice at all. So it was interesting. So I, I understand that. And, you know, I, I dig, one of the things I dig about your voice is I love the raspy effects. So that that's working for me. I, I love that type of sound. Everyone's got their own flavor of music. Everyone likes a certain thing, a certain sound. I really connect. I love that type of sound. I, I love that voice that you got there. So uh, what's going on now? You just finished up that tour. Uh, I'm assuming you're home now. Where is home, by the way? Where do you live? Lancaster, South Carolina. Okay, so... Born and raised. Same small town. I live a mile up the street from my folks. Okay, and that's where you are now, right? That's your home now. The house we love. Okay, and now what are you, what are you going to do now? Are you, in the, are you having some downtime? Are you not having downtime and you're working and writing music? You've obviously written music when you're away. Are you putting any of the instrumentation behind it? What do you, so what, what's up now? What's going on with you? Well, I'm catching up on my jewelry making. This is the time of year where I'm getting a lot of orders for custom pieces. It's a holiday. I like jewelry. Look at all this stuff. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I need to make you something. I got, this is, what this was a good idea. This is called my spookies. So they've got like a a haunted, haunted on it with the amethyst. So I just, I kind of make all kinds of stuff, but I'm doing a lot of that right now. And um, I just finished a benefit. Sunday I had a big benefit. So I was planning that. While I was in Europe, and it came to, you know, the big day on Sunday, and we ended up raising close to, uh, I think, maybe close to $4,000 for some friends of mine. Uh, Chip, he had fallen, and he got a spinal cord injury and was unable to work or walk, and the therapies that he's had and his surgeries have helped him to, he's walking again, but he's got to continue them, so we raised money to help them continue that. But that's the kind of stuff I, I talk about I love doing. I got a show. I'm doing like a guest appearance. I'm not doing big things uh, a lot. I'm, I got big things spread out. Like I'm working on one for my hometown now. Another benefit to help kids and families in need at Christmas time. But I'm doing a Halloween show, just like a cameo appearance. I got like four songs, maybe at the most, that I'm going to do Friday night in Charlotte, North Carolina at Moorhead Tavern at the Spooky Bash. And then I'm working on um, a tour 
to Memphis at the end of January. I'm going to Memphis. I'm the uh, house band leader for the Women in Blue Showcase again this year. You know the International Blue Challenge where the bands compete? Yeah, I, I, I've heard about that. I've never been to it, so that's pretty cool, right? Yeah, that's really cool. So yeah, okay. I did the first one back in 2013, and now I'm a part of the organization and help them put on the event. So that's really cool. And so I got to work on putting that. It's an all-women house band. Uh-huh. Um, and I got to start work on that really soon. And then I'm working on another trip to Europe. And I'm doing a um, – yeah, I got a couple shows here and there, but nothing really – Nothing really, uh, no big tour yet. I will have to keep you posted on it. But, yeah, yeah. I got stuff going on. It's just like a, a, a little bit of downtime, but a lot of background scene stuff going on. Yeah, very cool. Awesome, awesome. So I'm curious about this. The songs that we just heard that we play tonight, we're going to play a final one before the end of the show. You did mention that these are musicians that are hired to do this group of work. Now, I, know that, I think you said you do that when you're on – how do you do that? When you're on tour, obviously – you can't bring musicians from the States because obviously some of them can't travel. So when you're on tour in these different countries, how do you hook up with bands there? That's got to be complicated, right? Well, it, it's, I thought it was going to be complicated, but it's really not that complicated when you really? got some help. Um, like I said, my friend Angus in Scotland, he helped me and he connected with me with some bands. I did some solo performances and then I hooked up with bands there. And what made it easy was that I can pretty much jam with anybody. I'll do my solo set where I do my original music for my record. And then I'll get up later and play guitar and shred it out on some blues with oh, the band. Nice. Uh-huh. And I'll do some, you know, some edited games and some standard blues stuff. But they don't have to really learn my songs. But for my CD release party, we made a rehearsal space with a, a drummer from Israel and then a bass player from New York. Um, they had sent them my music earlier and they learned it. And then we had one rehearsal and then went and did a show like that. And, uh, you know, it, ain't nobody got time to rehearse. Most of these players, they play with so many different bands and they learn how to read music. They charge it and they do their homework and then they can come and, and put together a kick ass show. Yeah. And that's the kind of players I like working with. Very, it very makes cool. my life a lot easier. Yeah, how about any, I just how, it's going on, I just don't have time to rehearse all the time. How many? How about any duets? Are you ever thinking about doing a duet with a male vocalist and yourself? Are you writing music to think about that approach? That that's kind that's of that's what I just came out of, Baron. It's, it's called Stolen Hearts. I, that my second record was a duet. Oh, is that right? Okay. I'm, I'm supposed to know that. How did I know that? I talk now. It's all uh, uh, it's all good. I'm trying. To, I'm still trying to forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to do it where we went romantically connected. Maybe okay. that'll work out better. I'm, I'd like to do some three way harmonies with uh, some local artists that I work with. They they recorded. I did a I did a song uh, with said X and these girls recorded uh, harmonies on it and we did a show together. But I. Three voices together sound phenomenal. So maybe do like a Dixie Chicks, but more roots instead of country with those girls. Maybe so. I'd, I'd love to do that. There's nothing, but to me, there's nothing than the feeling that harmonizing voices bring. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm curious when you're on stage and you're up there performing, you're digging what you're doing. Are you thinking more internally to get to gather your internal emotions? Or your emotions gathered from the player, from the people that you're playing to. So where are the emotions coming from? Yourself internally, or are your emotions being drawn from the people that you're entertaining? Hmm. Good question. It's it's a little bit of both. I think a lot of times music is my uh, where I can run off to. So like whatever I'm going through in my personal life that day, walking up on stage, I can drop it. Or I can use it. It's my choice. If I, it, it, depending on what the song is, depending on what's going on, and every show is like uh, I interact a lot with the crowd, so it does have a lot to do with the energy exchange I get back to. Whereas what my emotions are doing in my music, but it's always that, that's the one thing I've always heard about. Like somebody watching a live show. They love the emotion I put into it. They know I'm having a good time. They can feel it. They connect with me. So um, I think it's just it's a lot of balance between both of my own emotions. If I'm feeling bad, I'm not going to let them get in the way of me having a good time with my people. Most of the time, I feel better. 
from that exchange. Very rarely do I go out on stage and feel bad when I leave. Yeah. You know, it's that that's never that's never the case. That is my refuge. Is there ever a song that you wrote that just the emotional intensity of that one song means that you can't do it any time that you want to do it because the emotions have to be there and you know that tonight your emotion is not that way and you won't be able to pull it off as emotionally as intense as you wrote it? Is there any song you stay away from when the emotions aren't right? Well, there is, there is a, a new song that I recently wrote co-wrote with somebody it was a um a lady who had lost a son and she wrote a whole bunch of poetry about her loss and she i think she's from australia and, and, and i'm not sure i've seen her name michael ruby michelle micah sky and she she's a holistic the children's book author she asked me to turn her poem into a song and so i did and that's a song that i have to be in in a certain place before I can perform it live, um, and it takes a lot for me not to get too emotional where I can't deliver the song properly. Properly, because you start getting all snotty nose and crying. It's hard, man. Yeah. And this is one of those songs. It's called Shining in the Light. You can buy it. You can go check it out on Amazon. And this, but I recorded it on my iPhone and sent it to her, and she put that on Amazon. It was so real and so raw. That's the way she wanted it. I couldn't, I tried to record it to her like five times and I couldn't get through it without crying. It's one of those songs because wow. the underlying story behind it. But yeah, that's definitely one of those. And I hadn't recorded it like, I, I think I'm going to re-record it and put a band behind it and do it more justice um, when I make my next record. But that, yeah, that's definitely one of those songs. And it, wow. it brings tears up especially the parents, people who have kids, yeah. that they connect to the idea of losing a child or if they have lost a child. It's really tough. It's one of those songs that, man, wow. yeah. gives you it gives you feels. Well, one more question that I'm going to make sure that everyone knows how to hook up with you for more music, understanding where you're playing and just the philosophy of what you're doing with your life. But did you ever write a song where you thought, my God, this is like the pin. I can't, I don't know where this came from. It must have been in my heart. It came in. I don't know where it came from, but man, I'm really digging this song. I love it. Do you ever worry about having that pinnacle where you're going to have a hard time and worry about hitting that pinnacle again or even going above it? Is there any time where you think, my God, what am I going to do now? No, my life and career, my music, my writing, my jewelry, every, all my outlets are like, it seems to have a natural ebb and flow. Uh -huh. If I'm doing something creative, it seems like I'm always in a flow. Songs come, they need to be written, and they come to me when they're ready. So I don't really battle with that or worry about that. I, I feel like, obviously, my songwriting has grown tremendously. My next record will house a bunch of great evolved songwriting for me and I'm you know I, I don't know that I'm a one-upper <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I want to always do better than my last creation I want to grow from it I want to learn from it so you know I, I don't know that there's a, a, a pinnacle per se that I, I feel like I'm across and I'm not going to ever get back to that I just don't have that kind of outlook on life I feel like as long as I'm breathing and growing and learning and open to it it's always going to get better uh -huh. And I, I may have some downtime, but I, as long as I'm not worried, worrying pinches off creativity quicker than anything can. No Worry and doubt. Yeah. And those that I try to just keep out, that has no space in the, in the same space with creativity. Worry, doubt, it don't, there's no room in there for that. Yeah, yeah. And so I, you, yeah. That's where creativity goes out the window. And then you start worrying about other people, what they think, and if you're going to please. Wow. If you, uh, I, I write for self-healing and therapy. Yeah. And I think if you keep that kind of attitude about it, it's really hard to, to feel like that. Yeah, and everyone probably does at some point in their career. For instance, when I first started the radio show, I used to take, because I worked for a radio station back then, and they used to give me and every other, every other radio personality, they used to give them the show on a CD so you can leave the studio with it. And I would play it back and I would grade them. This is a, out of a 10 scale, this is a 4. Out of a 10 scale, this is a 7. 
out of a 10 scale, this is like a seven minus. I used to do that and I used to worry about if I had a show that was a seven, the next week was a five, I used to think, my God, I'm going down. I got to do something to raise that bar. I used to worry about shit like that. And then I started watching like Saturday Night Live and I used to see some shows that were great, some that sucked. And I started thinking it's a natural occurrence. Don't stress it out, right? And then you start just doing the show. That's right. And, and, just, and make the numbers to the doctors and the lawyers and the accountants. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I stopped worrying about that shit. Now I just do the show. And and it's it's a much more fun gig to do it that way without the stress. Right, so having fun and feeling good is the main thing about everything. I cannot stress enough. No matter what you do, if it ain't fun, don't fucking do it. Yeah, good If you don't make you feel good, don't fucking do it. Yeah, that's right. So I'm going to hang up on you. What I'm going to do is I want to make sure we know how to hook up with you because I'm going to have sex with my wife. It's fun to do it, and we're going to do that. I love doing it, so we're going to do that later on. But in the meantime, how do people hook up with you, find you, find out what you're doing? Is there a separate site or a link on your site for the jewelry aspect of your do what you're doing? How do they engage in the whole you? All right, so Pam Taylor Music is my handle on everything. It's my website, pamtaylormusic.com. My Facebook is Pam Taylor Music. Twitter's Pam Taylor Music. Instagram's Pam Taylor Music. I just started a new Instagram page for my jewelry, Stolen Hearts Creations by Pam, and I abbreviated the SH Creations by Pam. And there is a link to my Etsy store from my website, um, and I have a YouTube channel, and it's Pam Taylor, too. So if you just type in, you Google me, baby, and I'm everywhere. You can find, if you if you, if you you get to my website, if you get to my Facebook page, and you, and you want jewelry, if you message me, it's all me running all of those things. So as long as you're on something that says Pam Taylor, and it's me, this mug, or a picture of my new record, then you're at the right spot, and you can shoot me an email. I run it. I'm, I'm, I'm there. You can reach out to me personally. It's me running the show. So let me know what you need, music, concert, event, benefit, jewelry, video work, promo. If you need a poster make, I have design posters. I can do websites, whatever. I'm here to help in whatever capacity. And I know how to do a lot of things because I've done them for myself for the past 10 years. So I can help awesome, in any way awesome. possible. Advice on anything. I'm going to be looking at your website for jewelry because I'll show you. I've got two thumbs here without rings on them, and I've got a couple nice perky nipples without nipple rings. So I'm going to be looking for that. And, of course, you know what I'm going to say, the cock ring. Do you have cock rings? Awesome. <laughs> well, how do we get a measurement for that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you something that's... I'll send you something that exaggerates my size and just so that it, my whole audience knows, my God, look at the cock ring that guy ordered from this woman. Look at that. And then, then it'll be like, I'll, I'll be in there and it'll be so loose it'll be falling off all the time. Who, who knows? So it is great having you on the show, Pam. I love having you on. Come back on again, okay? Maybe before a tour, next CD, a next solo song, a next video. Come back on and say hello to us, okay? Yeah, I'd love to. I'm gonna. I'm actually working on a music video for Christmas, a naughty Christmas song. It's called "Let's Get It On for Christmas." So, if you do, if you do feature any kind of Christmas, it's naughty and it's right up your alley. Nice. Now, if you get that song out in time for the Christmas show, which will be on two weeks before Christmas, let me know and I'll, I'll throw it in the mix. Yeah, I'm gonna shoot for like the day after Thanksgiving. Nice for nice. music video release. It'll and I can go ahead and send you the song and let you listen to it. It's kind of a play on the Let's Marvin Gaye, Let's Get It On uh -huh. and Christmas. So <laughs> that's but that's gonna be cool. That's cool. I'm gonna squeeze you in there like the song Squeeze. Did we <laughs> we didn't play that yet, so we're gonna end the show with Squeeze Me because I'm gonna squeeze you. Squeeze. squeeze me. That's right. Squeeze me. So uh, in fact. If I give you the penis ring that's too small, I might have to squeeze me to fit it in there, right? So there, there's another spin on the squeeze me track. Let's end the show here because it's getting worse. Let's end the show with squeeze me. Pam Taylor, thanks so much for being on the show. You were a blast as always. I loved it. Thanks so much. Thanks to uh, Beatrice Kimmel. of extent of Now she's with this new group called Hyper PR. She introduced me to you. Thanks to Beatrice Kimmel for sending you my way because you've been a tremendous guest. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you, babe. Love you. Okay. I love you. Okay. Peace out. Thank you. I love you, too. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. -bye.